creativity in the di digital age. This is really my testimony of um, coming crawling out of my art studio and either deciding to step away from teaching or really lean into um, meeting our students where they're at. And uh, it's been a journey. It's a con it's a continual journey, uh, but it's an important journey. Uh, probably the most important thing that I want to share through through this is how I'm really learning to realize the value of creativity with technology. Uh, so I'm going to give you a bit of a context here. So it, this is my family. So I, I'm in Collinsville. This is my, um, my my wife Kelly, my daughter Amy Rose, and Madeline. Um, she's starting school next year. It's insane. It's like everything's happening really quickly. Um, in my artwork, I, I have a, a studio in Collinsville. I'm a portrait painter by trade, but I'm a narrative artist, narrative painter. Um, if I'm not painting portraits on commission, I'm painting portraits for myself because there's nothing more interesting to me than, than people. Uh, and, and so for so many years, being in the studio, uh, swinging a paintbrush, getting oil you know, all over me, I, I picked my head out of the classroom one day and I realized um, there's kind of this shift happening and it was kind of startling. So for each of, each of my daughters, um, I'm doing as a gift. When she was first born, I said, I'm going to paint her portrait every year. And I, 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 I can't. So this is Annie Rose. For her first birthday, I painted her portrait. So this is what she got. And then um, my daughter Madeline is turning one this summer. And this is a work in progress for, for her first. So uh, as you can see, um, my family is everything to me. You know, I, I see all things through the lens of, of my family and, and working to be a strong husband and father. Um, so when I'm in the classroom, when I'm, when I'm teaching, it's really, really important that I know what my why is. Why, what is my motivation when I'm in the classroom? I know I can, I can teach a shoe to draw, you know. Um, what are my students really doing? Why am I motivated uh, to, to teach them? So... This is my motivation. Um, she is starting school in the fall. She's starting pre-K. And every time I'm in the classroom, I'm thinking about her entering into this house of education. You know, this house of education, I'm in this, I'm living in this house right now. What am I doing in relationship to her future education um, that's going to be a benefit to her? What am I demonstrating and modeling for my daughter as, a, as an artist um, that's relevant, pertinent to, to her? So I wrote her a letter. This is a paragraph of the letter that I, that I wrote for posterity. Um, excuse me. I want to scrape and repaint every room before you get there. I want to paint the ceilings with a fresh coat of empathy. The floors a durable coat of grit. The walls detailed with purpose. The long hallways covered with discernment, and the whole house illuminated by creativity. Now that's a house of education. Uh, you know, I have this kind of um, altruistic view of how I want my daughter to go through education, and I'm just trying to figure out how to merge the arts with technology and, and make that and make that kind of thing happen. So I've had a very bad start with, with technology. Um, this, I, I'm the head of the arts at the master school uh, in West Simsbury and you know everyone's intentions are, are really great and we get so excited well, maybe three years ago it was everyone has to have an iPad. An iPad. Oh my gosh the iPad is the greatest thing in the world. Uh, the iPad, the iPad, the iPad. And I just, I stopped teaching for, for a moment and I researched and I looked and, you know, the largest uh, uh, company in the world aside from oil is freaking Apple, you know? Apple, I didn't feel had my students' best interest in mind. They had the bottom line in mind. And I just saw, when I peeked my head out of the studio, I saw this, this kind of, um, I'll show you in a second, but this evaporating of the value of the arts and this increased lust for technology, for the sake of technology. Uh, and I was very cynical uh, about it, uh, to, say, to say the least. This is Calvin and Hobbes. Oh, greatness of the mass media, thank you for elevating emotion, reducing thought, and stifling imagination. Thank you for the artificiality of quick solutions and for insidious manipulation of human desires for commercial purposes. This bowl of lukewarm tapioca represents my brain. I offer it in humble sacrifice to be styled by flickering light forever. Uh, th this is really my attitude toward this explosion of technology that was happening. <clears throat> so, yeah, the increased value placed in the culture of technology rising in direct proportion to the evaporating value of fine arts and education. Um, I, I wrote kind of a, a, long, a long thing that it caused a stir in my school, and I didn't mean, I wasn't trying to be 
divisive. They made this really big push for technology and fiber optics and all this stuff. And I just had to say, wait a minute, uh, you know, hello, hello from the arts. We have value too. <clears throat> so they said, okay, uh, it, it, the arts has value. You're in charge of the arts. You're, you're our director of the arts. And I didn't ask for that. I didn't want to be that. But they said, your charge is to, you know, demonstrate what this value is. And uh, that's been my, my plight for the last couple of years, and it's been it's been great. So, so I had to stop kind of teaching drawing and painting, and um, for a while, and look around and, and ask uh, objectively ask what what are the value of the arts? <clears throat> uh, I recently had a roof put on my house, <clears throat> and uh, when you get a roof put on your house. In that process, when you're driving, you notice other roofs on houses. Mm -hmm. You notice slate roofs, and uh, in New Hampshire, my family is—they have metal roofs, but they're gas, like blue metal roofs, and like horrible things. So when I have something stuck in my mind, like the value of the arts, all of a sudden I'm aware of you know uh, where the arts are devalued, and it's like illuminated, and it, it's distracting actually. Um, I write—I I think I wrote 15 um, recommendations for my seniors. Uh, for college, and when we go on this site called Naviance, you have to, as the educator, you have to click what you teach. And I'm a mother, you know, in the education of others, there's, there's no provision there for art, and it, you know, it's a, just a small thing, but um, I found that kind of interesting. You know, and then a very brief search brings up articles like this Every university eradicates its visual arts department, pretending an ominous trend in university education. And I'm a portrait painter. Of course, that's a safe thing. You know, portrait painting. You know, the great, the great tradition. You can't go to a museum around the world without the most predominant, preeminent artwork being portrait painting. No, there's two legislators um, looking to slash the cost of uh, the the government spends on portraits. Uh, you know, extravagant price tags on official portraits and spire built cut cost to just you know just twenty thousand dollars. Uh, and then this is the editor from Huffington Post. It just reinforces the idea that the government is a bunch of clowns spending 50 grand on oil paintings. Uh, so, you know, I'm just bit by bit seeing that there's either no value or a or a decrease in value. Even to the point where, uh, you know, Obama. I promise you, folks can make a lot more potentially with skilled manufacturing or the trades than they might with an art history degree. Now, nothing wrong with an art history degree. I love art history. I don't want to get a bunch of emails from everybody. He actually retracted this statement, but the point was, I didn't see so much the, the words as I saw, um, you know, th this is the moment, I took a screenshot, this is the moment where he's saying that, and oh, it's the, can you imagine an art history degree and, uh, making a career in the arts? Well, you know, doesn't the, the form and function of education start from the top, right? It's, you know, the, Legislators and the presidents and these people are making decisions about what has value and what doesn't have value, uh, and that that's what I've been very sensitive to. So, so I have been making a case for creativity. Uh, it's not a stretch to make this case. I mean, there's so much information out there, but this is just skipping a stone over uh, some of what's been really, really important to me. Uh, this is a painting I did of one of my favorite artist educators in history. Uh, this is Robert Henry. Um, Robert Henry had a, um, I guess you'd call him an opponent, William Merritt Chase, the Chase School, the, uh, the new school in New York, that, that was started by the Chase School. Uh, his uh, um, idealism was about the art spirit, that's his book, the artist, um, you know, the artist himself, not so much the work, uh, and how the artist sees the world and the importance of creativity. <clears throat> and, you know, I have on my nightstand, I have the Bible and I have my, my art spirit on my nightstand. And this is a, the book is full of these quips, but when the artist is alive in any person, whatever his kind of work may be, he becomes an inventive, searching, daring, self-expressive creature. He becomes interesting to other people. He disturbs, upsets, enlightens, and open ways, opens ways for better understanding. So I, I've been preaching this for a long time. Um, it, Who's, who watches TED Talks? Anybody watch the, the TED Talks online? Okay, the most viewed TED Talk of all time, the number one most viewed TED Talk of all time um, is this guy, Sir Ken Robinson, about how schools kill cre creativity. I don't agree with everything he says, but he has a very, very poignant um, you know, opinion about uh, the importance of education and just sort of putting a floodlight on why creativity is so, so incredibly important. 
So I think it was 2005 or 2006, um, I came across this author, I heard him on NPR, and he actually spoke, he was a keynote speaker at the Connecticut Art Educator Association. His book has gone on to become a New York Times bestseller, but he's a, Daniel Pink, he's a presidential speechwriter. He's also on the TED Talks, you can, you know, he's got millions of views. Uh, but his perspective as a non-artist about uh, education and about the workplace is that if it can be mass produced, it will be. If it can be uh, automated, it will be. If it can be, um, you know, uh, reproduced cheaply, uh, the, the most important thing is innovation in, uh, in students and in new workers. And he writes, the future belongs to creators and empathizers, pattern recognizers and meaning makers. These people will now reap society's richest rewards and share its greatest joys. Abstract thinking leads to greater creativity. That means if we care about innovation, we need to be more abstract, but in our businesses and our lives, we often do the opposite. We intensify our focus rather than widen our view. We draw closer than, um, rather than step back. So the, the last of influence I'm going to share, a lot of it, but uh, this is my cousin John. I grew up with this guy. Uh, he was a uh, really high, high overachiever. He was a naval, uh, naval Academy grad, um, lieutenant. He went on to become a Navy SEAL. He was wounded. Uh, wounded in action, um, he owns a defense company, he, he's all over the news. He's on, uh, every week or two I see him on MSNBC, he's on CNN, uh, he's become one of the world's preeminent authorities on cyber warfare. Um, and, you know, working privately with different companies, uh, a client is the CIA and the client is, you know, um, the, uh, Virginia Tech, that's one of his uh, his clients. I mean, he, he's doing all these really innovative, cool things, uh, and he gave this amazing talk at the Naval Academy maybe a month and a half, two months ago, where creativity is at the heart of his business. He, they are creative. It's a think tank. I mean, they are they're inventing and creating these crazy things um, in order to you know get ahead of uh, the cyber warfare. We need to ensure that we are continually pushing the confines of imagination and creativity. And he really highlights the exponential growth of technology. I mean, he uses a, a chessboard as an example. Um, you know, the story is something like the, this man goes to the king and he says, I have this new game, it's called chess. And uh, if, if you beat me, you know, the king said, if you beat me, I'll give you whatever you want. And, and so uh, the, the man with the game won and he said, I just want one grain of rice. One grain of rice, but I want you to multiply that for every, for every square of the 64 squares. And, um, you know, that ultimately uh, the grain of rice would be the size of Mount Everest, you know, at the end of the 64 squares, and he compares that to the exponential growth of technology and how technology is growing at a rate so far faster than any of us really understand, and we, we can't even envision what the possibilities are, and that's why creativity is so important, in, you know, in his business. Okay, so arts and technology, but how? Um, I went to uh, I went to grad school and I had a choice uh, in my last grad program that I attended to do either studio arts or engage in this thing called technology, for which I had no idea uh, how to um, how to even jump into the, the technology. So with my own business, um, I've been growing a web presence. Uh, this is my my website for my studio. Uh, I have a Facebook fan page. I have uh, a YouTube channel with little videos that I'm playing with. Uh, and I have a uh, page dedicated specifically to portrait painting. And I've been building this over the last, I don't know, four or five years. Bit by bit, it's, it's become sort of this thing that's fun. Um, the learning curve wasn't, wasn't terribly steep. Um, but this is the only basis of understanding I have. So I said, okay, I'm going to create a course, an art course, called Digital Journaling. And I'm going to take what I've learned here and I'm going to put it, I'm going to plunk it in my classroom. So I taught this, um, taught this course, I, um, I created a course, I used these, these principles. I said I'm going to use digital platforms to help students cultivate creativity, to tell their unique story, very, very important, to help each find purpose, to discover gifting, to build empathy, to foster responsible web presence. Very altruistic. I mean, there's, again, like, like the Robert Henry, I just... I really want the focus to be on the character stuff of, of the students. So after the first year of the class, I said, any feedback on improving the course? Uh, student, I get what you're trying to do, but your class sucks. And I'm not even kidding. Like, that was, 
that was a, a student, a, a senior student, um, and I just sat down with that student and I said, you know, that, that was rude. Whatever, what? Tell me how I can fix this. You know, what? You're not giving me what I need. You're not meeting me where I'm at. So uh, the student, his name is Seth, and he worked with me for like a week, and I just laid everything out on the table, and he he just he suggested clump this here, clump this here, clump this here, and then back away and let us let us go. I'm like, oh, okay. So that's what I did. And so four or five years later, here's, here's our course, Digital Journaling, The Art of Creating a Strong, strong Web Presence. Um, I, I won't read all through that for you, but um, you know that we're applying design principles to web building and photo imaging. We're learning the basic functions of new digital media, exploring basic, uh, the basics of video and video editing, learning how dig to digitally store, edit, and safely upload content, create a meaningful and appropriate web presence by critical analysis, and honor each student's uniqueness. So the three fair assumptions uh, that we, we base the course on is, number one, public digital content lives on in cyberspace forever. Um, I, I'm not even, these aren't even assumptions. I mean, this is, this is just, I, I would say they're, they're a fact. Um, number two, we are each the sum total of our own digital exhaust. Anybody here do the um, Facebook movie? Did you get a Facebook movie? You didn't? Facebook for their 10th, 10th uh, whatever anniversary, if you're a Facebook user, they made a movie for you. Maybe you didn't even know that, but it's a, a very short little movie, and it's the sum total of your digital exhaust. It takes your highest posted, you know, uh, quips, photos, and it makes a moving stills, Ken Burns kind of thing out of it. It's pretty, it's pretty cool, and that's really what's going on. What you're putting out there is the reality, which leads me to number three. The only verdict that matters is from the court of public opinion, period. Online, fair or not fair, and I, I keep seeing it time and time again in institutions and with students. Um, with my students, we do we spend some time with uh, pitfalls of social media, but you know uh, that that's not what I want the focus to be for um, the class. This this is an example. I'm not sure if there's volume or not. If there's not, that's okay. Oh, there's one. An example of something that I would uh, highlight with my students. You know, it, it's a it's a funny thing. Um, it's the kind of thing that we all laugh at. That video was parodied on all the the networks. This like this is ten years ago. This is the first legitimate um, uh, viral video, over a billion views, a billion with a B views of that video. So here's a clumsy overweight kid trying out for a play, right? And somebody puts a video on a tripod, videotapes him, whatever, and then they make un unbeknownst to him, they make a parody out of him, um, and. Uh, he had to leave school. He was institutionalized. Um, it it really, really did damage to this kid. Uh, so the the cause and effect of what we see and what we laugh at, and ownership of things, um, that all of that has to be kind of made apparent to uh, to my students, and they're kind of shocked to to read and to learn the story about that about that kid and kind of the horrible psychiatric things that that had happened to him as a result of that. So we do talk about you know bullying. Um, you know, about 75% of visited the website, bashing another student. What we really focus on with the pitfalls um, is stupidity. I don't know if you, you came across this. Did, did you see this? Okay, so uh, this woman, Justine Sacco, this was not all that long ago. This was over, over Christmas. Um, she is a uh, so, um, media specialist for one of the big networks, like CNN, or one of the really big networks. And she's getting in a plane uh, from uh, L.A. Uh, wait, from London to South Africa. That's what it was. She's flying from London to South Africa. Before she gets on the plane, she writes, "Going to Africa. Hope I don't get AIDS." Just kidding. I'm white. So, turns off the phone, gets in the plane, and that tweet goes like wildfire. It's the most trended tweet in the world at, uh, at that time, to the point where, while she's in the air, if you Googled her name, um, Google put the flight path on Google. Um, hashtag has Justine landed yet. That one 
little snippet. This young woman built this career to the point where she had a very important job with a very big whatever um, landed, you can only imagine, turned on the cell phone and her world turned inside out. She's begging the media, begging to leave her alone, you know, monsters stop stalking me, death threats. Uh, she blew up her career, really her life for a time, um, you know, with, with something so stupid. But that's not what we want to focus on. We're building a positive web presence. I want my students to understand the pitfalls, but I want more, more so for them to understand um, you know, how to build a positive web presence, and we do this using uh, a lot of the principles that we use in our class. So my student, Seth, uh, he worked with me. We broke up the course into three, cor three parts. Number one is voice. This is kind of a hard thing to, to qualify or to quantify uh, with, with assignments, but um, I think we've been doing a pretty good job in doing it. Um, my wife is an English teacher. She gave, she gave this assignment and um, NPR this, I believe. First day to ask the students, what do you believe? Well, I, you know, I believe uh, cupcakes are the best food in the world. I believe in belly button limp sweaters are really wonderful. It doesn't matter what, what they believe. Um, a lot of these students have never had the form or opportunity to really express what is near and dear to them. So one of my students, you know, he just blasted this thing out about um, you know, fathers being responsible, and how his father had left him, uh, and how, you know, it's just imperative that, you know, fathers take on the responsibility of, um, you know, of being men. We have an assignment like this where we'll ask, um, you know, to dress up. Personal style is very telling of a person's taste and aesthetic. You know, okay, uh, go online, what event would you go to, what kind of outfits would you wear for that event, and, um, you know, kind of paint a narrative about what your ideal is, and then we post that. You know, my job is not to be judgmental. My job is not to say, well, you shouldn't wear, you know, zombie skull, whatever. No, it's whatever whatever you feel is reflective of you, uh, that's, that's what I want you to do. You know, we ask the question, what is beauty? You'd be surprised with a question like this, especially with like high school teen uh, teenagers, seniors, a common answer I get, what is beauty, is who cares? I know what hot is, I know what sexy is, you know, what, what is beauty? There's no dialogue, there's no inner dialogue about that, so I challenge them um, with, with that. So they're online, they're looking around at what resonates to them as beauty, and then they write about that. You know, I have them develop a web sensibility by collectively talking about what makes a good, bad, interesting, you know, website. Okay, so it all culminates into this. What is my flavor? So Carrie Ann will be sitting here. I'll say, Carrie Ann, uh, grab a pen. You're going to write this down. And then I say, okay, everybody, we've seen Carrie Ann work all semester. She's done videos. She's done writing. She's part of our community here. What kinds of images would you expect to see in a web presence from Carrie Ann? And Answers are thrown around and Carrie Ann's writing them down. And then we say, what kind of color schemes? And is there a discernible texture that would represent Carrie Ann? What specific theme would best represent Carrie Ann? Would Carrie Ann's site be served, uh, best served with videos, images, writing, instruction, demonstration? Um, and then I would ask, Carrie Ann, is this feedback fa a fair representation of you? Almost every student said, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, you kind of nailed it. So. The student then posts, okay, this is kind of what I got from the class. Uh, natural, white bases, simple, blues, pastels, sand, not smooth, clean, images and writing. This student agrees with everything and wouldn't change anything. And so then I had her make just a simple blog based upon those principles, and here's her blog. Maybe she would have gotten there without the class input. Um, however, she's affirmed in kind of this, this presence that she has holding the mirror up to, to what it is that she's doing. All those attributes are represented with that aesthetic, which I think is really interesting. Okay, part two, media tools. And this is the part where, you know, I'm kind of steward of this idea, but I'm honestly not the most qualified to be doing a lot of, you know, a lot of the stuff. Um, but I want them to explore photography and video and web design and all this stuff. Um, you know, assignments, uh, assignments for design that we do in, in art class all the time, balance lighting, viewpoint, sequence, perspective, atmosphere. 
you know, portrait lighting. We'll do assignments about portrait lighting. We'll do, you know, depth of field. This is an art class, but these aren't all art students. And they're for the first time ever exposed to these principles. Carrascaro will do a week on, on Renaissance painting or Baroque painting. So then I take my hands off the class. Uh, I say, all right, I've given you basic tools. We're set up with different things. You know, everything's kind of drag and drop. We use Wix. We use like whatever is available to us. And I say, now I want you to find uh, the, the cause or the project that you want to pursue and that you want to make. So here's a student who made a, um, a scouting website where he's got video clips, highlight clips of students. A lot of our, we have really, really good basketball at our school. Students come from all over the world to play and coaches from all schools go to his website to look at the stats, to look at the schedule, uh, all student made. Uh, Ruth just got in uh, a couple weeks ago to Fashion Institute in New York. So she has focused all year on developing a portfolio and a web presence uh, to kind of, again, affirm what it is, her passion, her direction of where she wants to go. Um, this student, Izzy, she works with a professional photographer. And she's an 18-year-old kid, and she had no idea that she had a professional portfolio available to her. Now she has a URL to give to schools, in which they, they all have done this. They've said, thank you very much for your interest in me. By the way, would you take a look at my online portfolio? Uh, and some of our kids are going like gangbusters with this stuff. Um, this is a student who is the editor-in-chief of Smart Girls Club. And she has since left uh, our school. She's moved to Texas. She's a senior. Uh, but there's, I think, 80,000 members of the Smart Girls Club. There's over 100 employees. It's a global um, you know, uh, entity that empowers young girls. It started with a book, and now it's this, there are blog sites and articles and all of these things to empower young women, and here she's the editor-in-chief of this. And I, I, I think they're going public with this. I mean, it's a big, big, big thing. Um, really amazing. And a lot of my students have this altruistic bent as well. You know, I have a group of students that are working with an organization to help um, bring attention to human trafficking on the Berlin Turnpike. You know, and the, and the sex trade that's going on on the Berlin Turnpike. There's really horrible things happening right nearby, um, and they're using classwork <laughs> to make this kind of an impact, which is pretty powerful and pretty amazing. So all of this is also improving our own digital exhaust at our school, where you know little things. We're making little two-minute, uh, two-minute videos, uh, archumentaries. You know, it's not so much the the polished product, but just the process. You know, uh, people don't have the attention span for a fifty-minute video of a thing. Question. 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 I'm not going to show the whole video, but you know, this is a typical kind of thing that I'll, I'll make. I've done, you know, about a dozen of these. A, a flip camera taped to a pole, and and that's and that's it. With with a little bit of editing, uh, super easy to make. Technol old school and digital. Well, this is a recent picture of my classroom. So I have, you know, my dry erase board with instruction. I have old school drawing horses that, that my dad made for me. I have students using burnt wood, you know, charcoal drawing. Uh, I have a model, but then I have my, you know, I have my projector in my classroom, and I have a touch screen stylus where I'm doing drawing demonstrations here that are projected up here. You know, it's, and this is all recent. It's really starting to, you know, to intersect and, intersect and emerge. And then from my perspective, I can say, this is what I want people to know about my classroom. I pick up my phone, I tweet this, and it goes to our new web, website extension, you know, Artstream Live, where the videos uh, and just these fun things are, you know, in real time popped up here. And it's starting to, it's starting to take on. I have uh, three or four other teachers who are doing this as well. I'll often get emails for, to correspond to prospective students. So, you know, our 
school's really wonderful, you know, we, we focus on preparing college portfolios, we have all these great students going to all these great places, you know, hope, hope you join our team. By the way, check out the link to the Artstream Live. Or, by the way, check out our TMS Facebook page where I wrote pics of a regional art exhibition six students were part of on Sunday. This is just a couple weeks ago. And then there's our Facebook page with, you know, not fancy pictures on there, just, just telling the story, just holding a mirror up to what it is that we're doing. This is all bringing incredible value to our school. You know, the value of the arts was, was going this way, and now it's, it's really, it's in tandem with, with the growth of technology. So this illustration that I created really is the model of, you know, as I'm walking forward with more of an educator hat than an artist hat when I'm in the classroom, I really want my students to be using creativity to build empathy, to find their gifting, to find their purpose, and to tell their story. This is so important, and this is something, even at Tungsis, you know, if we did more of this, just telling the story of what our, what our students are doing. Um, I had class yesterday, what's today, Friday? Wednesday, I had class. Um, I had a student whose mother passed away uh, last week, a 19-year-old student, she has a five-year-old brother, and um, Wednesday was her mother's funeral. Unexpected death, it happened just like that. Um, funeral was Wednesday, after the funeral she came to class. She came to class. Why did she come to class? You know, I, well, because I'm such a great teacher, you know, no, uh, there's a feeling of safety that our students have at the school. My school, at the master school, a survey goes around, um, what's the number one reason why you send your kid to a private school? Safety. What's the number one reason I believe my, my students keep coming back to class at Tunxis Community College? Safety. Safety. They, they know what to expect. They feel valued. They feel respected. They feel what, what's happening is going to be predictable. They know that we as faculty and colleagues actually care about each other and our students. That's, tell that story. Tell that story, and you want to see your enrollment go up, I promise you it will. I, I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it firsthand at my school. So this is the last thing that I wrote to my daughter. Before we pack, uh, in that letter, before we pack your lunch, uh, on the first day of school, know this. I don't care what you learn as much as I care about how you learn, and especially how you see the world around you, and the way you treat others. My advice, love the Lord, be a renaissance woman, be creative. Love, Daddy. So thank you. Thank you very much. I don't, know, I don't know what the time, the, the time is here. I'm not sure if I was over or whatever. But if you have a couple questions, um, I'm happy to, or suggestions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah. How long do you often play? How, what time span is the course given? Away? It's a semester. It's a semester? Is it every day? Mm -hmm. um, it's twice a week for a semester. So I've done it for the year, and it's, it's better for the semester because what I do is I really wind them up, and at the end, they're really just starting with their product, Yeah. but then they're still doing the product. I have a student who, uh, he gets over 600 views for each um, blog he posts. I mean, he has a fan base, yeah. so that's my hope that I'm winding them up to, to get them going. No, it's either, yes? Are you aware of paying attention to the um, attention to, um, like, uh, STEAM? STEM, a yeah, of course. Uh, are yeah, yes. Up, so, a into STEM, you know. right. So the question was, am I aware of STEAM, science, technology, engineering, uh, math is the STEM, and the A is the art for the STEAM. Uh, and yeah, we're we're very aware. Um, you know, Obama is a big STEM proponent. That's why I put I had put that in there. Uh, and although our school is not, you know, doing the the STEAM thing, we have the STEM, but then we have a big <laughs> fine arts sphere also in and of itself. Um, and what's the creativity, this part, th this, is, this is ubiquitous. Th this is happening, this is growing and filtering into everything, and I just want to highlight the visual and fine arts and how yeah. it, there's such a value, we're doing it in the fine arts. Well, the, the RISD school has a big, um, on their website, they have a big project to go into their STEAM activity. Yeah. Which is the yeah. art school. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi. I like Hi. that idea of you know using the visual and whatnot and the creativity. But the only thing I always have this in the back of my mind. I'm always so concerned with because um, I from the English department. So concerned with you know the responsibility that goes along with letting kids just go on their own in the blogs and do you know what I mean? The 
you know. Can, can you qualify the, that a little bit more? The, res the responsibility. You of, know, of, of, you, of you as a teacher, of you as yes, a teacher? Yes, because you, know, you hear so much uh, negativity about, like, oh, you know, the professor did this and that college. Or the, you know what I mean? That kind of, huh. you know, that yeah. kind of um, ultra-conservative, uh, it was just a big thing recently on you know, they're talking about some student was complaining because the professors had said this, whatever it was up the other day. I forgot what it was. was at Eastern. Yeah, okay. they had to retract and the professor had to give an apology. So that kind of thing makes me hit a little bit hindrance uh, to utilizing, you know, yeah. the internet and the spheres and the blogs because whatever you goes on, you know, you're always being questioned. But I remember, whatever you put on there is going to get out there. Yeah, that, so, that, I, I yeah. understand that. There's two parts to that. Um, yeah. The, the first part is a, is a fair usage part where I want the students to have the ability as an educational setting, they can experiment, experiment with stuff, uh, they can use stuff. Uh, a theme that I use with my students a lot often, and I, I see this all the time with my college, uh, college prep students, their weakness is all, almost always their biggest strength. I have a student, the student Seth, who helped me uh, with, with, with that. Um, he, uh, he had attempted suicide. He wrote a blog about depression and he expressed like what he went through. He told the story of his very, very dark um, time and the response of my students. He's discovering a heart of service that he has and empathy that he has because of the, the dark things that perhaps on the surface a teacher might say, oh, you can't write about how you cut yourself. And, and this, I'm not sure if that's relevant to what you're saying or not, but I'm, um, I'm finding way more success with, with letting them go. Like I also give my cell phone number. I also give my Facebook. It, it's very rarely abused, if, if ever. But there is a caution that it's calculated. It's risk reward. I'm finding yeah. the risk, the reward far outweighs far outweighs the risk. And one of the things I like about the way you structure your course is just instead of just hey, here's all this great technology, you're gonna use it. I look, I love the way that you're kind of okay. How, well, how how do you look to people that aren't you? Are you just yeah. like. You know, we all have uh, we all have our own kind of monologue going, but we're used to person to person understanding how we're perceived. But mm. digitally, we're pretty naive about that. I like the way you structure the course to be both personally expressive, but also like, oh, I love that critique assignment where you just have the student not say anything in the front of the room, and this is how your classmates are perceiving what you're putting out. As yeah. we weren't online the first year. Everything was all in-house, all password protected. There was nothing. But then I peeled the veil off of that, and I said, "Let's do this." No, come on. They're they're already out there. They're they're tweeting and texting. They're already out there. I, you know, I, I'm not responsible if I am watching these kids go out without there being a measure twice, cut once mentality of how imperative that web presence is for them, and how awesome it is that what we're doing in the art can benefit that. Even tell the story. I paint. Well, do a video of me painting or do a video of me drawing. That all of a sudden elevates the value of what it is that I do. So, okay, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Yeah.